striking similarities between Prince Harry and Edward VIII, the Queen's uncle who abdicated the throne, choosing love over duty. The ultimate comparison is them both ending up with American divorcees. Despite being separated by nearly a century apart and the different expectations of royal rank... When you are heir to the throne, you have this script to follow. ...their military aspirations. Edward VIII, as Prince of Wales, was keen to go to the front line. Lord Kitchener says no. If they said no, you can't go to the front line, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through so nice. Choice of wife. Courtiers were very sniffy about an American divorcee coming in. Who does she think she is? The sibling rivalry. You ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And eventual exile were all remarkably similar. He tried to have his cake, eat it, and then order another cake on top. As royal commentators dispel the myth of the monarchy. They ended up with the king doing the conga round the staterooms of Buckingham Palace. Experts will break down key archive from crucial moments in royal history. It was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. So prepare to discover what actually happens when blue blood runs red. What have you been doing in here all day? This is The Royals Revealed. In this episode, we'll reveal how Prince Harry and Edward VIII's lives mirrored each other's. Those major royal players trying to find a solution to a constitutional crisis. Why both royals were labelled the party princes. They put the gramophone on, pushed back the carpet and cut a rope. Couldn't be playing music till six, seven in the morning. At the time, the most controversial aspect of that story was that the bodyguard was in the jacuzzi with him. People wondered how on earth he would be able to reach his weapon in time. How love ultimately conquered royal duty. She did cue him in for the kiss, and I loved the way that it was a bit of a Hollywood kiss. Good for them, uh, where he... It's what they normally do with a screen kiss. It's not actually on the mouth, it's on the lower lip. George V, when he was introduced to Wallace Simpson for the first time, was so appalled by seeing his son, Prince Edward, at associating with a married woman that he shouted, that woman in my own house. And what does their exile say about our royal family? In the presence of the Queen, you're not really going to have people mouthing off and effing and blinding. No one person changes the monarchy. From the moment the two princes entered the royal realm, they were destined to experience persistent scrutiny from the world's media. Royal children have always been exposed to prying cameras, whether it's paparazzi or whether it's staff cameramen belonging to, uh, to newspapers. We had that very famous photograph of Harry sticking his tongue out at photographers. Uh, photographers are not always uh, kosher. They, uh, they egg on. For example, Harry only stuck his tongue out because the photographers were doing exactly the same. The uneasy relationship with the press continued into Harry's adolescence. Lots was written about Prince Harry's teenage years being that of a royal rebel. He was a playboy prince as far as the press was concerned. There was a bit of that. Um, there was obviously the legendary cannabis smoking and Club H, which was Prince Harry's sort of social scene at Highgrove. And what we saw was Harry falling in and out of nightclubs, sometimes a little bit inebriated, on the odd occasion lashing out at paparazzi. All of these things are damaging, perhaps, to a certain extent for the monarchy, but actually, interestingly, endeared the public to Prince Harry because there was this sense that he was just a normal lad uh, trying to let off steam. The same can be said of Edward, who, at the impressionable age of 16, became the Prince of Wales. Prince Edward was um, the golden boy of the royal family. He was the, probably the first royal pin-up. His, his face appeared on uh, playing cards, on matchboxes, on tea towels. Uh, he, he was seen as the bright hope of the royal family. But the lofty title didn't prevent his own regal rambunctiousness. They put the gramophone on, push back the carpet and cut a row. Couldn't be playing music till six, seven in the morning. Because the nickname that Edward had was Peter Pan. And certainly, just as Peter Pan wanted to fly to Neverland, Edward wanted to escape Buckingham Palace, a place that he hated and always had bad association.
I think with Edward, when you are heir to the throne, you have this script to follow. People practically tell you what to do in order to get there. That is your position in life that you're born to. It is inevitable, perhaps, that at some point you'll want to break loose, find your own voice. With Harry, Harry is the spare. He's like, my brother's got this. There is no particular roadmap for me. I'm just going to let loose. And that's what he did. Both princes had grown up with media attention, but they'd also grown up surrounded by the military. I remember him as a five-year-old strutting down the private road at Kensington Palace in army fatigues and um, a parachute regiment, Red Berry, uh, and he loved every minute of it. And it was the army that provided timely escape routes for both princes. But this led to Edward's first serious run-in with the state. Edward VIII, as Prince of Wales, was keen to go to the front line during the First World War. Uh, Lord Kitchener says no, uh, and he was absolutely right. The heir to the throne does not go to the front line because there is a possibility that the heir to the throne might catch a bullet, might die, and got to find somebody else to take his place. He was prevented from going to the front, apart from one, on one occasion, and then he joined various staff officers to inspect the trenches, and he was lucky because a, a German shell landed by his vehicle, killed the, his chauffeur, and because he was inspecting the trenches, he was spared that fate. As Harry ascended through the ranks, the fighting on the front line debate once again reared its royal head. If they said, no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am now, because the last thing I want to do is have my soldiers sent away to Iraq or wherever like that. And for me to be held back home, twiddling my thumbs, thinking, well, what about David? What about Derek? You know? Something about joining the army gives you that self-discipline, camaraderie, focus, and a meaningful existence of your own. So you're not being told what you're going to join and be part of something. His earlier exploits were all but redeemed until he swapped fatigues for his birthday suit as what happened in Vegas definitely didn't stay in Vegas. At the time, the most controversial aspect of that story was that the bodyguard was in the jacuzzi with him. People wondered how on earth he would be able to reach his weapon in time, if I can put it like that, to um, protect Harry in his time of need. After getting caught playing strip pool in his VIP suite, the posturing prince went on an apology offensive. It was probably a classic example of me probably being too much army and, and not enough prince. As they matured into their 30s, it would be time for both Edward and Harry to settle down. Though their choice of partners would send the monarchy into turmoil. Edward VIII and Prince Harry shared many similarities. Both were skilled in military manoeuvring. And both men had an eye for the ladies, although their tastes were very different. What's always been interesting about Harry is, although he's depicted as this playboy prince, he's always been very discerning in his choice of girlfriend. They've always been very bright, switched on young women with career ambitions of their own. Chelsea Davy, who went on to study law at Leeds University and became a solicitor. Similarly with Cressida, um, a fledgling acting career under her belt and hates the fact that people even mention that she was Prince Harry's girlfriend because she's much more than that. In Edward's case, it's quite interesting to remember the words of his, of his assistant private secretary, Tommy Lassells, who said of Edward that there was no great romance in his life and that all he'd had when he was younger was a long series of grand affairs. Edward's first serious girlfriend was Frieda Dudley Ward, the wife of a high-ranking Liberal MP. This predilection for the married woman may well stem from his relationship with his mother, Queen Mary. She was pretty distant with her children. Now, what do children want? They want that warm maternal attachment. But it sounds to me as if he was familiar with somebody being quite unavailable. So if that is his earliest influence, guess what he's going to look for when he's older? People who are unavailable to him, because he's used to that. 
Though Edward's and Harry's love lives were different, there was one striking similarity. Of course, the ultimate comparison is them both ending up with American divorcees. Edward had a steamy chat-up line when he first clapped eyes on Wallace Simpson at a country house party in the grip of winter. He asked her, did, as an American, did she find the central heating uh, poor in these country houses? And she uh, is apparently alleged to have said, uh, oh, so I would have expected something smarter from the Prince of Wales. That's the legend. But if either were getting hot under the collar, there was a problem. It was very much the case for Edward, as the future King of England, would not have been allowed to marry a divorced woman. So it probably wasn't the best idea to bring her to the palace to meet the puritanical parents. George V, when he was introduced to Wallace Simpson for the first time, was so appalled by seeing his son, Prince Edward, at associating with a married woman that he shouted, that woman in my own house. And thereafter, he had to be reassured falsely that Edward was not in a sexual relationship with her. Here was the future king lavishing Mrs. Simpson with what they felt was the family fortune, giving her jewelry, bracelets, necklaces. And the, the, the House of Windsor thought that uh, it was, it, it, they were being, being burgled from the inside out. Alec Harding, who was Edward's private secretary, often believed that the stress and misery that George was faced with for having seen his son cohabiting with Wallace was one of the things that led him to an early grave. Harding's theory may well have been correct, as George V died within two years. Leaving the bewildered new King Edward VIII to address those who are now his subjects. I feel that his death is not only an overwhelming grief to my mother and to us, his children, but that it is at the same time also a personal loss to you all. George V was very reluctant to admit his son, Prince of Wales, into the inner sanctum of monarchy. That is to say, to read the red boxes, all the top secret documents, confidential papers and so on. So he left the Prince of Wales hanging and he didn't really prepare him for his future role as king. And George would have been turning in his grave if he'd known who was tagging along at the proclamation. It was quite astonishing to uh, the British aristocracy and squirearchy that here's this woman, this twice-divorced American, being allowed into the inner sanctum to watch the accession of uh, Edward VIII at St James's Palace. Yet, for the British public, she remained a mystery. There were pictures taken of her next to Edward, and most of the papers owned by Lord Beaverbrook, the proprietor of the Express and the Evening Standard, either cut her out altogether or referred to her simply as Edward's friend. Unfortunately for Harry, there was no such censorship when Meghan came on the scene in 2016. At the time that she met Harry, um, and I think was a familiar face in the circles of, say, US breakfast shows and red carpet events in LA. I'm a California girl, born and raised, so I, um, the flip-flop culture is part of just who I am. I love my cutoffs and flip-flops and being as relaxed as can be. I think it's fair to say that before she was linked to Prince Harry, few people in the UK would have heard of her. Um, but after she was linked to Prince Harry, obviously, she's become one of the most famous women on Earth. Yet nothing could have prepared them for how intense the media scrutiny would become from portraying Meghan as the woman who would revolutionise the monarchy. No one person changes the monarchy. It's not something Meghan said when she was going to march into the monarchy and change it. And then there were the less forward-thinking factors. There was a bit of a narrative that seemed to be racially motivated about Meghan's background and I think phrases like exotic DNA was used along with straight out of Compton, which she wasn't. Harry wasted no time in trying to set some ground rules with a statement encouraging a ceasefire to the media bombardment. Harry called that up and said, this isn't right, you know, cover the relationship fairly by all means, but don't go around besieging family members.
as the prince protected his partner, 80 years earlier, the new king managed to get away to the Dalmatian coast with his. In the summer of 1936, they took a cruise on a boat called the Narlin, which traveled throughout Europe. And there are pictures of the American media with fairly straightforward headlines about the king and his mistress. And none of this made it into the British papers at all. And the continental press had a field day with one candid snap in particular. We've got one uh, key gesture here, and that is that she's putting her hand on his arm, which you don't do to royalty, but it's the way that she's doing it. She's using not just a loving hand gesture, it's a restraining movement. Um, it's all about power and control. It's quasi-parental. She's put her hand on his arm with the fingers straight, and it's a kind of a stop, restrain, control movement. Not just control over him, it would make her look like a very self-controlled woman as well because there's a little sideline on this uh, gesture, which is that not only has she got her hand on his arm, she's got her handbag hanging from her thumb. Now, that would only be somebody that was completely confident, completely in control and knew what they were doing. It's not something many people could pull off. The press took that as a, uh, a signal to talk about the relationship with Wallace. And it came as a complete shock to the British population. The press were duly dispatched to Wallace's residence, which was enough to send her fleeing to France. So the couple began writing to one another. Wallace used a word called enum, which she used it in her letters to Edward. And enum essentially meant frightened and scared. And in one letter that she wrote Edward, she said, when the two of us are together, I feel that we can just about bluff it out. But when I'm on my own, I feel terrified and I feel inadequate. As the furor grew back in Britain, news crews set about canvassing public opinion. King, he should marry who he loves. He's been a good chap to the working class. That's my opinion of him. I am a housewife. Personally, I think he is a sign of modern democratic times. I am a chauffeur by profession. After all, the king is a man like myself, but he should not allow his private life to interfere with his public life. If you go into the National Archives and look in their private vaults, you'll see thousands of letters sent to Edward, basically saying, don't do it, sir. Eight decades on, the public had warmed to Meghan. She really is beautiful, isn't it? Women particularly were drawn to her because she seemed to be the kind of princess who wanted to be heard as well as seen and to have a platform and to champion really important subjects like women's rights. And when they did their tour of the UK, uh, there were crowds in the streets shouting their name. There was such a huge amount of goodwill behind them both. But easing Meghan into the formalities of royal family life required some on-the-spot schooling from Harry. Harry, I think, is being very clumsy with what are called his tie signs here. He's being quite annoying. This is like an actress who is suddenly finding that on set, somebody's trying to give her stage directions. She's looking just slightly peeved that he's interrupting her, because that would be rude at any party. He actually beckons her over, which, again, would make her feel a bit powerless. And then he steers her and actually pushes her over to the next group. Nobody's going to like that very much. And what she does, she's very polite, she smiles, she comes across. But you'll see that she responds with a reciprocal pat on the back. She pats Harry on the back, so, like, you pat me, I'm going to pat you. And what that implies is that, yes, that's fine, and I know that this is a job we've got to do, but I'm also in control here. When we get to the church clip, again, um, a lot of this, I think, people were saying, oh, she's being told off and um, she's not comfortable. Again, I believe this was Harry's mistake. Um, and it's actually her, to me, caught up in a power battle between the two brothers, even at that stage, because she's very happily talking to William and Kate and smiling, laughing with them. You can see Harry getting more and more agitated. He faces front, he won't join in the conversation, his face drops, he turns round and he uses what's called a leading gesture. He, he points, sort of, no, pay me attention and look over here. And she kind of colludes, but it's a bit like she's dealing with a little bit of a spoiled child at that point. I think 
anybody entering the royal circles needs to come with their A game and be very resilient because not only do they have protocol and rules and hundreds of years of practice, but they also have the court of public opinion. We are on the outside looking in, judging. But even almost mastering the arcane art of the curtsy couldn't protect Meghan from some alleged friendly fire. Meghan and Harry, they felt that, that, that she wasn't welcome. She wasn't welcomed by William and Catherine she, and uh, that she wasn't particularly welcomed by um, other members of the family. So we do see similarities with Wallace Simpson, both on a negative front, this idea that courtiers were very sniffy about an American divorcee coming in. Who does she think she is coming over from America? So even if there were any lingering hostilities, Harry proposed less than 18 months after their first date. It happened uh, a few weeks ago, mm. um, earlier this month, here at, at our cottage. In terms of who has taken the lead in this clip, it's very interesting because um, the strongest signals come from Megan, who is using what's called pseudo-infantile remotivational techniques. She's clutching his hand with both of her hands like a small, vulnerable child. And that made her look very sweet and very cute. Just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. She wanted to be popular. She wanted to be ingratiating into a very difficult family. And I think that slight lowering of herself, that looking slightly vulnerable, was a very good ploy. Beneath that, though, we were getting some completely different signals because if you can see when um, she's holding his hand, she's actually stroking his hand with her thumb. And what that means is she's calming his down, him down. She's reassuring him. He doesn't like the press. He doesn't like to come out and be doing this. When they first walked out towards the press, she's rubbing his arm. Um, it's come on, let's get it over and done with, we're fine. It was good to see an intelligent woman, but she was in control. Both Harry and Edward had strong, independent women on their arms. But it was Edward who had to come up with a cunning plan to marry. In late 1936, Edward raised the possibility of a morganatic marriage with PM Stanley Baldwin, meaning he'd still be king, but Wallace Simpson wouldn't be queen. What he tried to do was he tried to have his cake, eat it, and then order another cake on top. And that led to the most spectacular meltdown in any kind of possibility of his remaining king. After the government rejected Edward's proposal, he informed the government of his intentions to abdicate on December the 9th. And by December the 10th, he was gone. Two hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. That I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. But the controversy was only just beginning for both royals.
Wallace Simpson and Meghan Markle both had a rocky start to life as royal consorts. One resorted to hiding out in a remote castle, whilst the other valiantly tried to continue life as normal, or at least normal for a TV actress, as they both fought adversity on the way to the altar. British women hated her. She got hate mail by the bagful, and she even had a stalker who went down to the south of France where she was hiding out, intent on killing her. It seemed the knives were out for Meghan too. There was a bit of a narrative around some of the demands that the couple had made, um, this sense of um, Meghan apparently going into St George's Chapel and saying that it didn't smell right, it was a bit fusty and musty, and that maybe it could have smelt better. Um, other stories then emerged of Prince Harry effectively telling, we think, one of the Queen's most senior aides what Meghan wants, Meghan gets. It's kind of set a narrative around a couple who were being quite demanding. Wallace had also tried to take control. Wallace Simpson got divorced in October 1936. Her divorce was technically illegal because it involved all of these various things, such as collusion with her husband Ernest. And it's almost certain that Ernest was paid off in order to allow the divorce to take place. So you have to imagine that Wallace, as a divorced woman, was actually in a rather odd position because her decree nisi didn't come through until April 1937. A fortnight later, George VI had been officially crowned. And with Edward VIII downgraded to the Duke of Windsor, the former king could formally seal the deal. But his wedding was unlike any royal nuptials before or since. The king and the commoner became man and wife. Edward's wedding to Wallace involved around a dozen people. It was being held in France with a vicar who was essentially a publicity seeker. Because the Archbishop of Canterbury, Cosmo Lang, who hated Edward, had specifically forbade any kind of formal ceremony taking place under the Church of England auspices. As the aged gatekeeper toasts the newlyweds, the Duke and Duchess appear to have their wedding pictures taken. Here comes the bride to join Edward in the happiest moment of their lives. I love the phrase, the happiest moment of their lives. I would say, tell his face that, because, um, no, what we're seeing, uh, not particularly blissful, I'm afraid. Um, they present, they, they stand there very nicely, they smile from the cameras, but again, Edward uses this Windsor male habit of um, anxiety rituals, and you can see him with the tie, and even more tellingly, when he's facing the cameras, you can see the muscle working away in the side of his cheek. So he was tense and impatient. What I find really telling, though, is when they finish doing the photographs and walk away, she just goes off up the stairs by herself and almost back into this kind of social role with the other people that are up there. And, and he's left to kind of go round behind them and just stand there. You'd expect them to be welded together at this point. Now, this is their wedding day, the clue's there. And yet she seems more like hostess socialising, but not with him. By the time that they married in the summer of 1937, Edward and Wallace had been the most famous couple in the world. And yet there was an absence of joy. And so if you look at Harriet and Meghan's wedding and the obviously joyful occasion that that was, it was in stark contrast to what had happened 75 years before. A new royal couple, a new chapter. And after the intimacy of the marriage vows, a place on the world stage. When they came out of the church, I think probably the most normal 
happily in love couples that we've seen in the royal family, really. I mean, he showboated uh, to the crowds out there. He looked immensely happy, which was very good. I think, you know, he probably, again, it had been a very tense build up to the wedding for him, but we got, I think, the old impish Harry came back at that point. She did cue him in for the kiss, and I loved the way that it was a bit of a Hollywood kiss, good for them, uh, where he, it's what they normally do with a screen kiss, it's not actually on the mouth, it's on the lower lip, and that means you don't mess the makeup up and everything. So I think they've done a bit of rehearses, rehearsing why not. In a rare triumph over the prying press, Harry and Meghan managed to keep their honeymoon destination a secret. Whilst Edward and Wallace openly tested the waters of public opinion around Europe. As the European honeymoon of the American born Duchess and her royal born bridegroom draws to a close, they still occupy the center of the stage as the King and Queen of Hearts. Despite the Sussexes' huge popularity all over the world, some areas of the media continued to plague them. Even news they were expecting was seen as fair game for critique. There was so much criticism about Meghan and the way that she kept cradling and holding her baby bum. And I, I don't know, some people in the press, it's almost like, oh, she's overdoing it and showing it off. So what? No. Um, I think the big problem was that people didn't get that for years and years and years, particularly in the royal family, it was almost seen as a bit obscene when they were pregnant. So they'd end up wearing a, a bell tent dress. And then suddenly we got a very liberated woman who would wear whatever she wanted to wear, even if it was quite a tight dress, a revealing dress, and, and constantly cradling the bump. And I would say good for her. She was so clearly in love with her baby bump, which is natural. The trouble is the media seem to have taken offence at this and gone at her quite negatively and made it out that she was doing something unnatural, abnormal, and almost to the point of heinous. And she wasn't. Lots of mothers do that every day, but they're not in the public eye. And I think for Meghan, it may have been another attempt to other her, put her in a different box. Have you seen the way she's behaving? It's not quite the done thing. Although there are loads of examples of Kate doing exactly the same thing. Even the decision to not replicate Harry's own newborn on the hospital steps shot was the subject of scorn. Births, deaths and christenings and weddings have always attracted media attention. Uh, the media want them. If they didn't let them in, there'd be a tremendous furore, as we saw with the christening of Archie, Harry and uh, Meghan, they didn't want photographers. And there was a lot of adverse press uh, against them. So, you know, it's, it's a catch-22, isn't it? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Eventually, enough was enough. And in October 2019, the Sussexes released another statement admonishing foul play. The second press statement was effectively suggesting that there was a vendetta or a campaign against Meghan and that the media wasn't motivated by the right incentives when covering the Sussexes. And that's then taking the coverage extremely personally and suggesting that you are being treated unfavorably, for instance, in the case of Meghan against Kate. Again, there's a short memory syndrome going on because back in the day when Kate was on the scene, she was being called Weighty Katie. Her and Pippa Middleton, her sister, were called the Wisterias because they were fragrant with a ferocious ability to climb. Short memory or not, Harry and Meghan were on the offensive and they seemed to be handling it personally. Some of the wording of the second press statement was a bit jumbled and a bit confused. It was also laced with Americanisms and therefore looked as if it was being written by Meghan directly. And when you've already got a narrative of Meghan driving a wedge and Harry being somewhat under the thumb, um, that only serves to confirm that theory. Regardless of whether Harry may have been wrapped around Meghan's finger, a couple of months later, everything unraveled. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced that they are carving out what they call a new role for themselves. As like his great, great uncle before him, Harry chose love over duty. I don't believe for a moment Harry forgot his purpose. I think Meghan suddenly found herself in a goldfish bowl that she didn't want to be in. When it was all kicking off, the Rawls did what any family would do. They held a meeting. The summit involved the Queen, Prince Charles, the Duke of Cambridge and Prince Harry. 
to have those major royal players trying to find a solution to a problem that had been likened to the constitutional crisis, the abdication crisis of 1936. Um, and I think, actually, when I spoke to people afterwards, they did stress that it was all quite cordial and controlled because in the presence of the Queen, you're not really going to have people mouthing off and effing and blinding. And as the press clamoured for answers... Harry, how are the discussions going on your future? The result was a very public separation as the Queen reluctantly gave Harry and Meghan permission to slink off to pastures new. Did he do it to protect Meghan or did he do it because Meghan asked him to? You can't be entirely certain, but one thing you can say is that Meghan has always seemed like a dominant partner in that relationship. Like Wallace, she's somebody who seems to have had a hold over him. And there's a famous line, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, whatever Meghan wants, Meghan gets. And you can imagine that being said exactly the same words, whatever Wallace wants, Wallace gets. In the aftermath of their abdicating announcements, relationships within Edward and later Harry's immediate family were strained more than ever before. And the mood between Edward's brother Albert, now King George VI, but known to his pals as Bertie, was understandably less than chummy. You're not just affecting George VI, you're affecting his entire family. And effectively, you've changed the rules of engagement and you've changed the whole dynamic of what's going to happen next. The recently married Duke and Duchess of Windsor was still followed by crowds wherever they traveled. In Paris, Britain's former king and his bride made the announcement that they were not intending to embarrass the royal family by settling in England. Since then, they have been world travelers. A major problem in the relationship between Edward and George VI after the abdication was money. Because Edward, was, Edward VIII had lied about what his financial circumstances were. He was worth around a million pounds, which was made up of a combination of cash and property. But he claimed that he was going to be essentially driven out of his own country, a pauper. And so his, his brother Bertie agreed that he would be given an, an allowance of £25,000 a year. It was going to be paid out of George's personal money because there was no possibility that Parliament would have voted for public money to be paid to essentially Wallace for all eternity. But when it became clear that Edward had been lying about money, there was all these very angry letters which both wrote to each other and George VI wrote to Edward. The reality of what happened was that I was completely misled. I'm not seeking to blame you or anyone else. I know how difficult a time it was, but I was lied to. And I think that you can see thereafter, their relationship never recovered. Edward was seen as an embarrassment. In comparison, Harry and Meghan ditched their titles, had to repay 2.4 million for the refurb on Frogmore Cottage, and stopped receiving money from the sovereign grant. Yet the cost to his own brotherly bond may prove to be even greater. We think the initial row started because William might have expressed some brotherly concern that Harry was rushing into things with Meghan. And I think William just thought, hang on a minute, you know, be careful. Um, and Harry took offence to that and felt that it wasn't showing enough support for the woman in his life. If there were simmering tensions, then perhaps the last thing the so-called Fab Four would have wanted to do was share a public stage. Do you ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, healthy, healthy disagreements. OK, the last thing you disagreed on, how do you resolve it? Uh, I can't remember, they come so thick and thick. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but it's, is it resolved? We don't know. Oh, oh, we don't know. Well, you're putting on a great show if it's not. <laughs> we had uh, Meghan and Kate slightly styled the same, which for some reason people wanted to see. Yeah, we got the two brothers, best mates. Huh. Um, and it was all going to be lovely. And obviously they'd got on really well and they were going to work together for charity. And then it just literally unpicked in front of our eyes on stage. We've got, you know, four, four different personalities. And every time that Harry spoke, you can see William and Kate their eyes go down, their faces drop slightly. It looked like there maybe wasn't as much agreement going on there and that maybe a little bit of limelight might have been stolen. And then comes the killer question about disagreements. And instantly, William, and it's, this is not like William. William, you know, tends to be a bit formal. Oh, yes, from the other end. 
Now the two women then um, use masking techniques, which is that they both put their hair over their face so that we can't see, but obviously the bodies are shaking with laughter, but that, not a good look, because I think that lets us know that actually this has been, uh, there's been a lot of problems backstage. William and Bertie may have struggled with their sibling separations, but Edward had an even greater insult in store. In the months following Edward VIII's abdication and Prince Harry's decision to ditch his royal duties, the old enemy, the media, continued to track both men's movements, desperate to know what would happen next. The media have made much of Harry and Meghan stepping down from royal duties and coined the phrase Megxit. Is there any chance that it actually might have been Harry's exit? He might have been the person to make the decision to say, you know what, I want to step away from this and protect my wife and my child. While Harry was being resolute, Edward surrendered to the Nazis, visiting occupied Germany in 1937. He was somebody who did the most stupid things. And going to visit Hitler, giving Hitler a Nazi salute, and being received by him in 1937, when Britain was on the verge of war. It was an action that you can only see through the prism of absolute rank stupidity. And he did so in order to show his wife that being an ex-king wasn't too bad. You still had people calling you your royal highness, which they did. Uh, all the kind of perks of being royal uh, were transferred to Nazi Germany. And I don't think it's overstating the case to say that Edward's visit to Germany in 1937 was the single worst thing he ever did. The severely agitated king had no option but to put as much distance between Edward and the Third Reich as possible. And only one punishment was deemed severe enough. He sent him to the Caribbean. 
he was made the governor there. On the one hand, it sounded idyllic. I mean, while his fellow countrymen were suffering rationing and dying in their millions, Edward was having martinis on the veranda with Wallace. But both of them hated it, because they'd liked their, li their life in Paris. They'd seen themselves as being these cultural sophisticates. And now they were on this small island where they had all the money that they could spend, but nothing to spend it on. He used to phone his brother constantly to give him advice. And it got to the point where uh, George VI told the switchboard operator at Buckingham Palace not to let the calls through. One of the Sussexes' last public appearances came at the Mountbatten Music Festival at the Royal Albert Hall, where they were the reluctant centre of attention. Suddenly, she emerged in victorious red. You wear red to be noticed. You don't wear it to kind of hide or anything like that. And the sheath dress that she was incredibly upright in, she had more makeup on than she would normally have worn. And we got the smoky eyes. It was a lot more Hollywood. I think he may have been expecting the old rotten tomatoes to come flying through the air, but he got cheered, and you can actually see as he's getting the applause and the cheering, he's almost growing in confidence at that point. And you can actually see him becoming very tearful as the clapping goes on. He has an accelerated blink rate. You can see him swallowing quite hard, and she kind of pats him to sit down, not because they don't want to be there, but I think he's probably going to dissolve in tears at that point. So I think he was moved and touched. I think they wanted to be there, but I think their worry was that other people didn't want to see them there. Once they found out they were still popular, not a problem. Though the Sussex backstep may not have been as momentous as a king extracting himself from a whole empire, Harry's departure highlights the dilemmas faced by those born to a life in service and how this can clash with their hopes, desires, and what they believe best for loved ones. They've gone off into the sunset to live in Los Angeles, and I hope they, they succeed. But he's not got any friends there, uh, and any friends he has made are probably strap hangers. But as they try and settle in the States, are there painful lessons to be learned from Harry's great-great-uncle? The irony is that they had huge potential as a couple to do good as humanitarians, for charities, but they didn't. They spent their, spent their lives going from one party to the next, and it was a fairly vacuous life in the end. And with Edward sometimes traveling alone, rumors of marital difficulties surrounded them for the rest of their lives. Who said there was a rift in this fabulous marriage? If this is incompatibility, I'll take some too. There had been rumours about the fact that the two of them were having problems and they tried to do something that is now very regular with public figures. They tried to disprove those rumours with their body language in a public display of affection. It's gruesome to watch. It's like a baby rejecting food, the, 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 the turning of the head. And then it gets worse because, you know, he's not going to let her go and she pulls her head away. You can see her arching her back. It, it actually looks as though she's, she's kind of repelled by him. It's awful, absolutely awful. As Harry and Meghan pursue a progressive new role, only time will tell how much or how little we will continue to see of them. I think that the major difference between Harry and Meghan and Edward and Wallace is that Harry has been somebody who's much more attuned to popular feeling than Edward ever was. I know that some people in Britain are glad to see the back of them because they don't think they've behaved well, but there are others who thought, fair play, you're prioritising your immediate family and you want to do things differently and you want to make some money, go and do it. I see their, their mission far more um, rewarding, ultimately, than that of Edward and Mrs Simpson. Whatever their future holds, one thing is clear. If Harry is to ensure he won't end up languishing in another country like Edward did, he must find a new sense of purpose and maybe, just maybe, tone down his vitriol against the press if one day they return to frontline raw life.
between, you're not really going to have people mouthing off and effing and blinding. No one person changes the monarchy. From the moment the two princes entered the royal realm, they were destined to experience persistent scrutiny from the world's media. Royal children have always been exposed to prying cameras, whether it's paparazzi or whether it's staff cameramen belonging to, uh, to newspapers. We had that very famous photograph of Harry sticking his tongue out at photographers. Uh, photographers are not always uh, kosher. They, uh, they egg on. For example, Harry only stuck his tongue out because the photographers were doing exactly the same. The uneasy relationship with the press continued into Harry's adolescence. Lots was written about Prince Harry's teenage years being that of a royal rebel. He was a playboy prince as far as the press was concerned. There was a bit of that. Um, there was obviously the legendary cannabis smoking and Club H, which was Prince Harry's sort of social scene at Highgrove. And what we saw was Harry falling in and out of nightclubs, sometimes a little bit inebriated, on the odd occasion lashing out at paparazzi. All of these things are damaging, perhaps, to a certain extent for the monarchy, but actually, interestingly, endeared the public to Prince Harry because there was this sense that he was just a normal...